Due to the graphic nature of this program, viewer discretion is advised. Did you really kill your mama? I guess I did. You're telling me you never killed anybody before? I ain't saying that. What do you got in mind, Henry? What do you think? What do you say, Otis? You want to go grab a beer? If you shoot somebody in the head with a 45 every time you kill somebody, it becomes like your fingerprint, see? But if you strangle one and stab another, and when you cut up, when you don't, then the police don't know what to do. You guys need any help? Do you need some help? Or can you do it yourself? That's when you go for a ride on this. It's always the same, and it's always different. You did right. It's sure good to talk to you, Henry. You're not judgmental or anything like that. Open your eyes, Otis. Look at the world. It's either you or them. Did I stutter? Give me the $50 and get out! Don't do that, Otis. She's your sister. Otis, plug it in. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to another edition of Viewer Discretion Advised. I uh, hope you're all doing well. This is the Halloween episode, so happy Halloween to everybody. Uh, originally I was supposed to have a guest on here, uh, my friend Carrie was going to be joining me, but uh, she canceled, she was sick, she had a, a cold I guess, but... Um, we'll have her on here in a future episode because uh, she appreciates fucked up shit like me. So it'll definitely be a good episode whenever we can get her on. And uh, yeah, anyways, hope she's feeling better. But the show must go on. And with that, we, or I shouldn't say we, I, by myself, watched a movie called Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. And I got to say, right off the bat, this is an amazing movie. You guys definitely have to watch this. Uh, I watched it on Amazon Prime. It's on there. You can watch it for free if you have Amazon Prime. If not, you can rent it on there. It's only like, I don't know, maybe two or three bucks. It's well worth it. Very pleasantly surprised by this movie. I had never seen it before. It's outstanding. It is... And how I kind of gauge movies nowadays is... I'll watch it and I think, well, would I buy this on DVD or Blu-ray? And I get kind of picky with that stuff. As soon as I got done watching this, I was like, I gotta buy this movie right away. Because the rewatchability on it, I think, is it will be great. And... Oh man, it's just such a good movie. It's so so dark and so disturbing and yeah, it just doesn't let up at all. Like it is just dark and bleak and disturbing just throughout the entire movie. There's no sort of change, there's no light moments, funny moments. It is fucking dark through the entire thing. Uh so yeah, we will be discussing this excellent movie all right so to get into the basic premise of this movie uh it's a psychological horror film uh it came out in 1986 but it didn't actually get released until 1990 it had like a lot of trouble finding any sort of distributor because people thought it was so controversial that they didn't want to distribute it they don't want to have it in like mainstream theaters yeah so this movie came out in 86 And it's about a guy who is just a serial killer. He goes on random murder sprees and he seems to kind of just operate without, you know, impunity. Uh, 
I mean, that's basically the gist of it. Like, it's just, you're just watching literally a portrait of a serial killer. You just, you're, you're not supposed to feel sympathy for him or anything like that. You just watch it. You just watch a guy maneuver in his life and just act completely fucking crazy. Um, but basically, yeah, it's, it's a story of, uh, Michael Rooker, who's the main guy. He plays Henry. He, uh, is kind of this like nomad. He just kind of like dr- he's ju- just drifts around the country, and his friend Otis, who is a guy that he met in prison, uh, he ends up living with him and their roommates. And Otis's sister comes to live with them, and she's kind of in a bad situation. Her, you know. She's on the outs with her husband and things are going her way. So she just wanted to get away for a little while and stay with her brother. And she kind of develops an interest in Henry. Not kind of. She does actually like right away. She gets the hots for him and they develop a bond. They both have sort of a similar background as far as like abusive history. Her father raped her. her his mother did awful things to him which we'll we'll get into that a little bit later because a lot of what is in this movie is actually based on a real guy named henry lee lucas which we'll discuss a little bit about and uh yeah that's basically just it that's it's just this guy going around killing people this girl likes him and his friend otis that he met in prison he's kind of like this low life drug dealer you know works like two days a week at like a gas station and just basically just like an all-around loser so with that let us get into the production of this movie uh so in 1984 there were producers known as the ali brothers and they hired a guy named john mcnaughton john mcnaughton was a former delivery man for their video like equipment rental business so when they hired him they wanted him to direct a documentary about gangsters in chicago in the 1930s and the film was called dealers and death and it was one of those movies that just gets released on home video it was never like in theaters or anything um and it was a moderate success and it was well received so the ali brothers kept john mcnaughton as, as a director for their company and they kept him on for a second documentary. This one was about the wrestling scene in Chicago in the 1950s. So they had discovered a collection of like vintage wrestling tapes that, and um, I guess the owner of the tapes was willing to sell them to the Ali brothers for the use in their documentary. However, uh, once the financing was in place and everything was kind of agreed upon, upon a price and everything, the owner ended up doubling his price and the brothers pulled out of the deal because they're like, no, a deal is a deal. We settled on this and basically we're, we're not, we're not budging. We're not paying more for this. And the guy thought, well, it was the 1980s. It was during that WWF boom of like Hulk Hogan and everybody. So he thought I can get way more money than this since wrestling is kind of in a boom period at this point. So anyways, yeah, the, the documentary was canceled. It fell through. So the brothers decided that let's just take our money that we were going to use for this documentary and instead just make a feature film. So the Ali brothers gave McNaughton a hundred and ten thousand dollars to make a horror film with plenty of blood so john mcnaughton he knew the budget was it was too small to make a horror film if he was going to make something about like aliens or monsters or anything like that so he was kind of unsure of what to do with kind of a a meager budget of a hundred and ten thousand dollars but then he saw an episode of 2020 about a serial killer named Henry Lee Lucas. And once he saw that episode, he decided to film a fictional version of Lucas's crimes. So let's talk a little bit about Henry Lee Lucas. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on him because I'm sure there's like a billion true crime podcasts out there that have 
talked about him and dissected him enough so I, it's just I, I'll, I'll give you like a little bits and pieces of his life but I'm not going to go that in depth with it but basically yeah Henry Lee Lucas was a guy supposed serial killer he confessed to killing 600 people uh, claiming that he committed roughly one murder a week uh, between his release from prison in 1975 to his arrest in 1983. So, yeah, I think he originally went to prison because he killed his mother, if I remember correctly. I think he stabbed her in the neck. And um, she didn't immediately die from that. I think they said that she died of, like, a heart attack, like, after the fact. But uh, needless to say, though, that's... I think why he initially went to prison. Um, and if you do a Google search on this guy, it's him and this other guy named uh, Otis. The fuck's his name? Otis Tool. It looks like Otis, but it's pronounced Otis apparently. So yeah, these guys were like best friends apparently, and they're based on the two guy. The two guys in the movie are based both on on them. And uh, apparently, they the both of them while they were in prison, they just decided to uh, start confessing to a bunch of murders. This guy Otis confessed to about 125 murders. Uh, as I said, Lucas he confessed to about six over 600 murders. Um. So yeah, while while the movie was actually based or inspired by a lot of Lucas's confessions the vast majority of his claims turned out to be false. Uh, there was a detailed investigation by the Texas Attorney General's office uh, and it was able to rule out Lucas as a suspect in most of his confessions by comparing his known whereabouts to the dates of the murders to which he confessed. So basically, like, his murders didn't add up to actually where he was at the time. Lucas was convicted of 11 murders but law enforcement officers and other investigators have overwhelmingly rejected his claims of having killed hundreds of victims. Uh, the Attorney General's office produced the Lucas Report, which concluded that reliable physical evidence linked Lucas to three murders. That's it. He confessed over 600 murders, but he only killed three people. And... I just got to say, too, real quick, do a Google image search of this guy if you don't know what he looks like already. Go on Google, type in Henry Lee Luc Lucas and Otis Tool, O-T-I-S-S. -S. Um, these guys just look like absolute pieces of shit. If you were to see them, you'd be like, yep, that guy is up to no good. He's doing he had he did something. I don't know why, but he did something. Yeah, it's it's disturbing. They just look exactly like a stereotypical serial killer, if you were to imagine one. So yeah, he was only linked to three murders, one of which was being his uh, his mother. Um, so why did he confess to over six hundred murders? Why would he do that? Well, the hundreds of confessions stemmed from the fact that Lucas was confessing to almost every unsolved murder brought before him, often with the collusion of police officers who wanted to clear the files of unsolved and cold cases. Wow, so everybody was just a giant piece of shit in this. They were just like, hey, we're too lazy to figure all this stuff out. So just confess to this and we'll we'll make it easy for you here in your, in your prison stay just confess to all these murders so we can get rid of them um yeah lucas reported that the false confessions ensured better conditions for him uh, as law enforcement officers would offer him incentives to confess to crimes he did not commit uh, such confessions also increased his fame with the public uh, lucas was ultimately convicted of 11 murders and sentenced to death for the murder of an unidentified female victim known only as Orange Socks. Uh, what a way to go in life. You're born into the world. You're living, I'm assuming, a horrible life. You get murdered by this asshole and nobody can identify you. So your legacy is Orange Socks. 
that's all anybody refers to you as. You're just orange socks. Uh, better than pink socks, I guess. His death sentence was commuted to life in prison by the then governor of Texas, George W. Bush, in 1998, and Lucas died in prison of a heart failure on March 13, 2001. Bye, bitch. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to talk about, too. So this guy, Otis, Otis Tool, he also did the same thing as uh, Henry Lee Lucas as far as confessing to a bunch of crimes, uh, crimes that he didn't commit. One of them being the murder of Adam Walsh. So Adam Walsh is the son of John Walsh. And John Walsh is the creator and host of the show America's Most Wanted that ran on Fox for a number of years, um, which they canceled for some reason, which I don't know why they would cancel that. How do you cancel a show that says there's murderers on the loose? We're going to cancel a show called There's Fugitives Out There because we got to make room for the masked singer or whatever else bullshit is on there now. Um, so, yeah, if you don't know too much about that story, it's awful and horrific. But basically, yeah, Adam Walsh, it was like the early 80s. Adam Walsh, the six-year-old kid, went with his mother to Sears Department Store. Remember Sears? Yeah. So Sears Department Store... Uh, He's playing a video game demo, and the mom went off to go look at something. She came back, and he was gone. And so Otis said that he, yeah, he just basically took Adam out of the store into his car and drove away. As they're driving down the highway, Adam starts crying. So Otis punches him in the face to try to get him to stop crying. Doesn't work, obviously. So he pulls the car over, goes into the back seat, grabs a machete, and he cuts this kid's head off. And later drives over a bridge and just chucks the head out the window, like into a river. And that's where they discover police discover you know his head basically because they were doing like this big search for him and when they found his head that you know that basically sealed up everything so however this turned out to be a lie because since like lucas he was confessing to all of these murders to try and get like you know a better prison stay like he would get you know steak dinners and you know tv privileges and things like that he actually saw the news report of what had happened to adam walsh and just repeated it verbatim to the cops and the cops were like oh well he must have done it then everybody's so fucking dumb in this uh yeah it's just uh, so he yeah he confessed to this and Oh my God, it's just so awful. But yeah, he turned out to be a liar just so he can get his steak dinners and his TV privileges. So yeah, they were both pieces of shit. Anyways, we're going to get off them and go back to La Moure. So, working on a budget. Uh, Henry, portrait of a serial killer, was shot in only 28 days. Uh, during the filmmaking, the director cut costs by employing family and friends. Uh, so yeah, there's, uh, he cast a lot of people as extras that he just sort of knew. There's, there's a woman actually that he's friends with. She appears as three different women in three different roles. One of them being, uh, <clears throat> when the movie first opens, you just see this woman's dead body lying in a ditch. Like she, that's, that's her. She plays another woman who, <clears throat> She has a glass bottle stuck in her mouth, like it, it's like go, going through her mouth. Uh, so she's just basically another dead body, and then she plays a third character, which is a prostitute who gets killed later. So, um, nice juicy roles for her. Uh, so because the production had so little money, they couldn't afford extras. So all of the people in exterior shots 
of the streets of Chicago are simply just pedestrians going about their business. Uh, for example, there's a scene where the girl Becky, she's like putting in applications and trying to find a job. Uh, she comes up from the subway and there's these, these, there's these two dudes that are just like arguing with each other. And they were actually having a real argument. So when the film crew showed up, they just refused to move because they were just in such a heated discussion. So the director was like, all right, well, we're just going to include you in the shot then. And so they're in the movie. It's one of those weird little moments that you see in a movie where it's like, it, it, it looks real because it is real. Like it's it actually, those guys are having a legit argument if you watch that movie. So yeah, I love little stuff like that in movies. Um, there's actually one, this is off topic, but just pointing out weird shit in movies. There's a scene in Back to the Future Part 3 where... Uh, Christopher Lloyd and uh, the woman that he's with and her two kids, they're about to get on a train. And as they're saying goodbye, there's a part where this little kid, you can see him, he points to his crotch and he like looks off camera to somebody, probably his mom. And he's pointing to his crotch and he's just like wincing, like saying like, I have to go pee. And I guess nobody caught that in the editing. They just completely left it in. So there's a part in that movie where you just, it's real quick, but you just see this kid point to his dick and gesturing to say, like, I have to go pee. Um, so I just stuff like that I just kind of find interesting. There's also another part in uh, The King of Comedy with Robert De Niro, which uh, he's in a restaurant and there's a guy sitting behind him in like in the background and he's mimicking all of the movements that Robert De Niro is making. So like when Robert De Niro makes like big gestures with his hands, the guy in the background makes the same type of gestures with his hands. It's fucking weird. I, I, it's amazing too, that nobody caught that either. But if you watch that movie, you can see that scene. And ever since I saw that, I'm like, I, I cannot, take my eyes off of it and it kind of ruins the scene um still a great movie though but yeah anyways getting back on topic um let me see here so yeah they cast michael rooker in the main role as henry if you don't know michael rooker michael rooker he's a character actor but he's probably best known for playing uh yadu in the guardians of the galaxy movies he's like that blue dude And he's really good. He's an amazing actor. Uh, Apparently, when they cast him, when he went on the audition, he just auditioned, I think, at, like, the director's apartment. And he was so in character that they weren't sure if they were actually, like, if he was just playing the character or if this really was how he was in real life, if he was this, like, really weird disturbing uh person so they were kind of almost reluctant to hire him because they were like i don't want to hire this crazy person but he was just being uh he was just like staying in character basically but it freaked him out enough to where they were they're like okay well he's that good we'll cast him as a lead role and he is that good uh and he remained in character for the duration of the sh- of the shoot uh even off the set uh, he didn't socialize with any of the cast or crew during the month-long shoot. Um, there was a costume designer that he would travel to the set with each day. And this costume designer didn't really know from one minute to the next if she was talking to Michael Rooker or if she was talking to Henry. Because sometimes he would speak about his childhood and his background, not as Michael Rooker, not as himself, but as Henry. Uh, And he remained so in character that during the shoot, his wife, Michael Rooker's wife, discovered that she was pregnant, but she waited until filming had stopped before she told him. Obviously, method acting works for some people. I don't think it works for everybody, though. 
but this definitely worked for him in this movie. You, you, it's chilling. Um, and when it does, when method acting doesn't work, it's embarrassing. Like there's a documentary on Netflix called, uh, Jim and Andy. It's about when Jim Carrey played Andy Kaufman in that movie about his life. And if you haven't seen it, it's basically like Jim Carrey just is an asshole through that whole entire production. Like on the set and off the set, he's just acting like Andy Kaufman. And it's not even like you don't watch it and think like, oh, wow, he's so brilliant. He's so deep and incredible. Like, it's just like, no, this guy's this guy's being a jerk. Like, he's not a method actor. He's a comedian. He was just trying this out and he just kind of failed and it just came off really bad in it. But Michael Rooker did not come off bad in this at all. He was quite excellent, as I said. This movie also kind of made me miss Chicago a little bit. I used to live in Chicago for uh, almost a year, I'd say. Uh, it was my first time ever like living out on my own. And uh, I went to a place called Second City where I wrote sketch comedy uh, with a group of people. So I did that for like a year. And, uh, yeah, it was just, it's cool when they like shoot movies on location and like, you kind of recognize the area, like you recognize like the streets and, you know, the highways and everything like that. It seems stupid, but like once you've lived in a place, you're like, Oh, Hey, that's where that is. I I know that street. I know that area. Um, so yeah, it kind of made me miss it a little bit and become nostalgic for that. So real quick, before I forget, um, I just wanted to mention the, uh, kind of similarities between Henry, the character in the movie, and Henry, you know, in real life. So, in the movie, there's a scene where Henry and Becky are sitting at the kitchen table, and they're both talking about their lives and how, you know, uh, Becky was raped by her father. And throughout the movie, too, you see her brother Otis has like a sexual attraction to her, which, you know, it ends up culminating in a scene towards the end, uh, which isn't too pleasant, but, um, and then Henry admits to killing his mother, but then he also said the the reason why he hated her so much was because she was a whore and she would make him watch her have sex with clients And she would also put him in a dress and, like, take him out in public, like, in a dress as, like, a little kid. Apparently, that is all true stuff. That is all stuff that happened with Henry Lee Lucas. His mother was a prostitute and would make him watch her uh, satisfy her clients and uh, would dress him up in a dress. So... There's other little similarities, but I mean, that's just the big one that I wanted to point out because I just thought that was very interesting to point out that he had to watch his mom get fucking deep dicked every night and uh, would get taken out in a dress. So you call that sick. I call that living the dream. All right, let's get into the release of this movie. Because there were a lot of issues with this release. Um, When the filming was done, the director, McNaughton, sent copies of the film to prominent film critics, uh, hoping to attract attention and thereby getting a distributor. Uh, The film premiered at the Chicago International Film Festival on September 24th, 1986, Uh, It played at several festivals throughout 1988 and 1989, where it attracted increasing amounts of attention. Uh, This ultimately culminated in positive attention from Roger Ebert at the Telluride Film Festival in 1989. A distributor called Atlantic Entertainment Group expressed interest in releasing the film theatrically, but mandated that it have an MPAAR rating. So guess what the MPAA did? I fucking hate the MPAA. You'll hear why in a minute. The MPAA responded with an X rating, the dreaded X rating. When you get an X rating on a movie, 
you're basically it basically kills the movie because that movie's not going to be shown in mainstream theaters it's not going to be promoted on television it's not going to be promoted on newspapers uh magazines you like you name it like it's just it's you your movie's going to be dead if it gets the x rating unfortunately um and the x rating is mainly associated with pornographic films so that right there is immediately like people see the x rating they go oh it must be porn or it must be something completely awful um but in Roger Ebert's review of the film he writes that the MPAA told the filmmakers that no possible combination of edits would have qualified their film for an R rating. So it indicated that it's not really a ratings issue, or excuse me, indicating that the ratings issue did not simply involve graphic violence. Um, yeah, I mean, when you, when you get a message like that, you just say, oh, well, it doesn't matter what type of edits you make to this, we're still going to give it an X rating. That's scary. I mean, that's scary for a filmmaker. You you spend all this money making this movie, and the MPAA comes back, and they're like, well, we're just going to give it an X rating no matter what. So with that, I want to play a little clip here of uh, everybody's favorite uncles, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, back when they had a show. And they reviewed the movie, and during this review, they mainly talk about the MPAA and just what a bullshit organization it is really because it's just a group of people it's just a group of people that they decide oh this is suitable this is not suitable but it's like they they really they end up kind of destroying a lot of independent filmmakers films and i'll discuss that further uh once you once i get done playing the clip here but anyways listen to this i think it's pretty interesting and insightful and uh yeah Enjoy. Many of the scenes in this movie are really hard to take, including one where they videotape one of their home invasions. There is no doubt in my mind that Henry is a powerful and important film, brilliantly directed and acted. But why should there be a film like this, a dispassionate record of a mass murderer? Well, because there are people like this, and one of the purposes of serious films is to help us see and understand the world we live in. It's an irony that mad slasher movies like the Friday the 13th series routinely get an R rating from the MPAA and play to millions of teenagers, anyone who can find that legendary 18-year-old adult guardian to go in with them, but let an artistic film come along that really sincerely considers the subject, and it's banished by the MPAA to that ghetto between the R and the X so that most of Theater chains are afraid or legally prevented from booking it. This film deserves to be seen. And you know, this must be the only civilized country on earth that doesn't believe there's such a thing as an adults only movie, a movie that is unsuitable for people under 17. We have the R, right. which is a joke, very loosely enforced, and then everything else is allegedly hardcore pornography. There's nothing in between. And do you know why they won't pass an A rating? I'll tell you why. It's because the A rating would have to be enforced and they would have to look at somebody holding money at the ticket counter and say, right. no, we won't take your money. And the MPAA and the theater owners are too gutless to do that. And so what we have are pictures like this being punished as a result. Well, I, I think you're right to include the theater owners because they're the ones that would have to do the enforcing. They don't want to get near it. Also, the media, uh, newspapers mm -hmm. and radio stations and television stations have policies that they won't uh, play or advertise X-rated films. So it's really the whole network here. Or it's even not just unrated films. You take a yeah. paper like the Los Angeles Times, one of the great papers in our country, its own critics have said that a movie like Henry and a movie like The Cook, The Thief, and so forth are great films, but will they allow them to be advertised if they were rated X? No. So yeah, it's just... Yeah, it, it, Roger Ebert basically summed it up there. It is all about money. That's really what it all comes down to. You know, they don't want to turn away any potential customers who have money in their hands and say like, Oh, I want to see Henry portrait of the serial killer. Um, and yeah, I got, uh, there's a great story to, um, Trey Parker and Matt stone, the guy that the two guys that created South park, they made a movie called orgasmo. And I think it was, it came out like shortly before South park came out and it was an independent movie and it was not even really 
that bad. Like, it, there's no real, like, sex scenes in it. There's no, like, real... I can't remember, but I don't think there's, like, really any nudity in it. Um, but they just wanted it to be, like, a strictly R-rated movie. They sent their copy out to the MPAA to get a rating, and they came back with an X rating. And they are like, okay, well, what can we change in this movie to get it to an R rating? Because we don't want it to have it be an X. And they go, oh, well, we can't tell you that exactly because uh, that would make us a censorship group if we told you what you had to edit out. So, um, you know, uh, unless we see another edit of the movie, it's just going to be NC-17 or it's basically the X rating. And they're like, well, we don't have really have the money for that. We don't have the budget to like go back and like edit, you know, and try to figure out what is going to work or what's what you're going to approve and what you're not going to approve. So... Just tell us what you want, and we'll we'll deliver that. And they're like, no, sorry, we can't do that. I guess it's just going to be NC-17. So the movie came out as an NC-17 rated movie. Cut to when they made the South Park movie. South Park movie was distributed by Paramount. They sent the copy off to the MPAA to get a rating. Came back NC-17. Trey Parker, Matt Stone, they go into a meeting with Paramount. They get the head of the MPAA on speakerphone. The head of Paramount says, okay, uh, we got an NC-17. Um, tell us what we can do to get the R rating. And they go, okay, yeah, you can cut this. You can take this scene out, uh, change this to this, uh, remove this and this, uh, You know, have this word change to this word, and we can probably get you your R rating. And they just sat there like in complete shock. And they just realized that the MPAA is in bed with all the studios. If you're an independent filmmaker, you're fucked, basically, because they're not going to give you any sort of advice or any sort of uh, uh, help as far as getting your movie released to a mainstream audience as if you're not backed by a major distributor, major company. Same thing happened with New Line Cinema. Back in the day, they weren't even... They were just an independent film company, and they had, you know, releases like Nightmare on Elm Street and things like that, but they weren't a, a real uh, a real big distributor. Once they got bought by Warner's, the Time Warner Company, immediately, like, they got all their phone calls returned, and they were saying, oh, hey, here's the rating for this, and this, and this, and it's just, it's, it's, makes me sick, and just, it's just angering more than anything, it's, it's just so stupid, and they basically are a censorship group, even though they say they're not, they are, anyways, I'll get off that subject, it just kind of makes me mad, and so, yeah, it's, uh, Roger Ebert said that this, movie is a perfect candidate for at the time they were proposing an a rating uh which was films for adults only that were not pornographic um but yeah needless to say this it didn't change much uh and due to the due to the rating uh the atlantic entertainment group they pulled out of distribution and following further controversy over the rating, Grey Cat Films picked up the film for distribution after it was screened at the Boston Film Festival in 1989. Uh, its theatrical premiere, a limited release, was on January 5th, 1990, uh, during which it grossed $609,000 like total. It's not too bad. You have a budget of $110,000 and you come back with... You know, a little over six hundred grand. Not too bad. Um, and that was due in part just because of the continued controversy of the film. Because the film is really, it's just it's very dark. Uh, as I said before, it's just it's it's dark and it's gruesome, and it's not a movie where like it, it's kind of it's one of those movies where after you get done watching it, you're like I. I think I need to watch like Family Guy or something to kind of cleanse the pal a little bit because it just, especially the way this movie ends, I'm not going to tell you how it ends, but goddamn, it's like, holy shit. Like it just ends so ill for everybody. So yeah, I mean, the director said like, look, I would have made cuts for the movie had they requested it and, you know, given the opportunity, but they didn't. So 
he just ended up releasing it as unrated because he felt like maybe it might have a better chance of succeeding as an unrated movie compared to being NC-17. So anyways, that's that movie. Um, my final thoughts on this. This movie is some kind of a masterpiece, a low-budget masterpiece. I mean, given the fact that it had a $110,000 budget, the cast and crew were basically just people that the director knew or was friends with already and had family members involved. To be able to produce something that's like this good, this quality, I mean, it really is amazing to watch. Some of the scenes are hard to watch, too. I'll be honest. There's a a scene where they videotape uh, a home invasion that they do. And it kind of, it just, you're forced to watch it, basically. The camera is just on the television screen, and you're just watching them beat and rape and kill everybody in this house. And they're having fun, and they're laughing about it. And I don't know, to me, like I looked at that scene and I kind of thought it was like some sort of, not to get all like artsy fartsy and pretentious, but I kind of looked at it as more like, well, I guess that's kind of the director's way of saying like, this is how we kind of view violence. As Roger Ebert said, like they'll give an R rating to something like Friday the 13th movies, which are, I don't have anything against them, but it's, it's just for the, for the sake of the argument, why would you give that movie an R rating? But then this movie, which deals with a real life situation, uh, you know, actual serial killer, you say, oh, no, no, that's too much. We can't have it. We just like that when it's fantasy. But when you actually put real shit in front of us, we're going to give it the X rating. So, yeah, I mean, that that scene is pretty hard to watch. But I think it was just the director's way of being like, hey, this is kind of how society views violence, especially when they watch it on television. It's just sort of like, you know, disaffected. You watch it, and then you just kind of carry on with your life. And even still, like, you know, I mean, I've I've, I've been in the room with people who, like, they'll go to turn on the TV, and they'll be like, oh, let's see what the hurricane's doing. You know, whatever hurricane that's on. It's like, oh, let's see what the hurricane's doing. Almost like it's a fucking episode of a sitcom or something. Like, oh, let's see what the gang's up to. It's like, hey, let's see what that hurricane's up to. Or, oh, let's see what's going on with that latest school shooting. Oh, boy. So, anyways, to sum up here, excellent movie. Highly recommend it. Very, very, very good. Watch it. It's Halloween. Watch this movie because what's scarier than a serial killer? It's a lot scarier than Jason, I think. Go watch this movie. It's superb. And with that, enjoy the rest of your Halloween, folks. We'll see you next time. I will hopefully have a guest next time because this was super fucking awkward to just do this by myself. I'm just basically talking to myself in a room uh, in an empty house. Uh, so, yeah, I have a, hope you have a good Halloween. And uh, take care of yourself and each other. And murder. Lots of murder. You know what? Just murder. Murder, 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 mur